everybody, this is another talk, and this one's called, What is it about the Great Lakes? And I'm going to meander a little bit today through di several different aspects of the Great Lakes, and I hope that we can all follow along together. Let's start off by asking a question, which I would do if you were in my presence. I'd ask you, what is the most precious thing you can think of, other than life itself, of course? And what I would finally end up by suggesting to you is water. It doesn't matter how the people of the word say it. The Germans call it Wasser, and the Spanish call it Aqua, and the French call it Eau, and the Swedish talk about Vatan, and Japanese is Godai. But regardless, it's all the same thing, H2O. And I suggest that that is the most precious thing on this earth. No matter where we find ourselves, that chemical compound, H2O, is used by every one of us on a daily basis, and it is the most precious substance imaginable. Without it, we cannot live. Our very lives depend upon our getting enough water, and most people don't never think about that. We know that fresh water is spread unevenly on this planet. Just compare, for example, our Ohio environment, as I'm sitting right now recording this in fifth floor in the North Edition here, I'm looking out into the parking lot watching rain splash all over. So compare our Ohio environment with, say, how about the Sahara Desert? Or even closer to home, think of our environment compared to say, the Sonora Desert or the Mojave Desert here in our country. You can see the importance of fresh water in those comparisons. I want us today to think about the greatest fresh water reservoirs on this earth, and they're right here in North America, the Great Lakes. I know the oceans are greater on a volumetric basis, but that's salt water. You can't drink that. Our lives are absolutely dependent upon fresh water. Fresh water is considered by scientists and other people as the fundamental, universal, and the only solvent that's acceptable to our bodies. Our brains are 73% water. Our muscles are 79% water. Our lungs, even, are 83% water. Our skin is 64% water, so our total body water is not distributed evenly, as you can see from those numbers. Even our blood is 92% water, and we all know that we mustn't become dehydrated. Our doctors tell us that. They worry about that. You go to the hospital, you're always provided with adequate supplies of drinking water. It is the first thing that usually happens in your hospital room, is to get adequate drinking water. The fact is, in the process of living, we lose water all the time. Some of it quite unconsciously. With every breath that we exhale, whether it's spring, summer, fall, or winter, we unconsciously lose water in the form of water vapor. And on a cold day in the winter, you can see it as you breathe out. That cloud that puffs out in front of your mouth and your nose is water vapor. It's condensed in that temperature. So we're always losing water. We lose it when we breathe. We lose it when we urinate. And then there's that thing called insensible water loss. We simply lose water through our skin, and we don't even know it. I'm not talking about sweat. I'm just talking about plain water. It oozes out of us as a vapor, and we can become quite out of water balance just by sitting around if we're not drinking water. So water balance is very important, but I'm not talking about water balance today. I'm just trying to put water in the context for you 
so that you realize its tremendous importance to living systems. The second slide is a picture taken from space, from a satellite, showing the Great Lakes. You're looking there at one of the most massive amounts of fresh water on this earth, and it's found right here in North America, and quite a bit of it in the United States. There are five Great Lakes, as you all know. I'm sure you could all name them. Lake Ontario, I'm reading on this screen picture from right to left, Lake Ontario, Lake Erie, Lake Huron, Lake Michigan, and finally the biggest one of all, Lake Superior, which is the farthest to the north. A recent article in the National Geographic magazine describes these lakes as a natural phenomenon so great and so fragile. And so I want to ask you, where do you think they came from? Uh, we've talked about this before, you may remember. Remember that chat we had about glaciers in Ohio and erratic boulders found out in the fields? And let's see, there were those glacial grooves on Kelly's Island. Remember those glaciers? It's the same phenomenon. The same glaciers gouged out the trenches, really the valleys, that filled with water to make the five Great Lakes that you see in this space photograph in the second slide. I put a slide in here, which I don't think I'll spend much time on, but I thought maybe you could catch a little of it. It's just a, an illustration showing the glaciers as they carved out, gouged out, bulldozed, whatever you want to say it, the soil and the rocks and the deep, deep seated soils to make these huge indentations that would eventually fill with water and produce the Great Lakes. And you can see in the first picture, upper left, about 14,000 years ago, the ice sheet moving downward, and then it retreated to some extent, and then 9,000 years ago, down it comes again and retreats, and then about 7,000, down it comes again. This thing oscillated back and forth, gouging as it went. And finally, at 4,000 years ago, in the lower right picture, we have the configuration, which is the modern Great Lakes. I don't know how well that photograph works for you. Maybe some of you can tell me as you, as you go around and see me here and there. This is a more difficult picture, and so I promise the last difficult one that we'll use. But I'm trying to show the geologic differences between the five Great Lakes in a profiled view. That's an ambitious undertaking. This was a, appeared in a recent National Geographic magazine. And starting on the left, you can see Lake Superior, 601 feet above sea level. And then you can see the St. Mary's River, and then another deep trench. Actually, it's shown here the double trench, one Lake Michigan, which is the deeper of the two, the other Lake Huron. You can see those measurements there. And then the St. Clair River, and then Lake St. Clair, about 572 feet above sea level, and then into Lake Erie at about 569 feet above sea level. And then there's that great big drop. What do you suppose that is? You can read it on the slide, so it's not much of a question. It's Niagara Falls, which is the biggest drop of all, down to Lake Ontario, which is 802 feet deep and 243 feet above sea level. Then comes the St. Lawrence River and a series of smaller lakes along the river, and finally out into the Gulf of St. Lawrence, the drainage system of the five Great Lakes. 
So this gives you an idea of this, something of the size, the depth certainly, something of the, the, the elevation of these lakes above sea level. Let's take one that we know the best, Lake Erie, the one that's right here in Ohio, at least we share. <clears throat> we have the southern border of it. The Canadians have the northern border of it. And I've chosen that profile approach to help us visualize these lakes. And I will have to see what my next slide is. Ah, well, I meant to tell you about that. When we go from Lake Erie to Lake Ontario, we got the greatest drop of all, about 160 feet. And of course, it's Niagara Falls, and which is you know, a wonderful place to go visit. And if I had you here, I'd probably ask you, how many of you have been to Niagara Falls? And I'll bet you most of you had. And what a wonderful experience that is. But you have to realize where all this water is coming from, from the four upland Great Lakes and falling down into Lake Ontario, the last of the five Great Lakes. <clears throat> that water flows along the Niagara River at a great rate and finally comes to this precipice and falls over it, and we call it Niagara Falls. Actually, the water is falling over the so-called Niagara Escarpment, which stretches all the way from approximately Rochester, New York, to well into Wisconsin as a great deviation of the earth where one part has split and rises above the other part, which depresses and leaves what is called an escarpment. And when you get to Rochester, New York, traveling west, it's where it begins, and it goes all the way to Wisconsin, wandering its way around and through the Great Lakes, and here's where we see it the best, at Niagara Falls. A thrilling place to go. In this slide, I've tried to show with color the drainage basins around each of the Great Lakes and I've changed the color. You can see superior at the top with sort of a, whatever color that is, purple, magenta, I don't know. And then you can see around Lake Huron in green, Michigan in a light blue, Erie in yellow, and Ontario in sort of a reddish color. These are the drainage basins of each of the Great Lakes and the interesting thing about it is that, except for Superior, most of this drainage basins, or the, the four drainage basins, are predominantly either industrial or agricultural land. And as such, both of them have runoff, which goes into these lakes. And in Ohio, for example, which is rich farming country, tremendous amounts of phosphorus phosphates and other fertilizers travel down the rivers, such as the Sandusky River and the, the Maumee River and other rivers, and flow into Lake Erie, depositing these huge amounts of transported fertilizers into the lake. And there we have the problem of pollution in the lakes. And we'll get to that towards the end of our talk today. But as you look at those drainage basins, the thing that also stands out, and not shown on this figure, are the cities involved. If you look up at Ontario, we have Toronto, and Hamilton, St. Catharines, and Windsor. All of these are large industrial cities. And if you come to the American side, you have Buffalo, and Erie, and Toledo. Detroit, Milwaukee, and Chicago, and Gary, and, and more. The point I'm trying to make is that the lakes are almost totally surrounded by high levels of population and or industrial complexes which use that water and dump it back as polluted water. The total Great Lakes water volume 
represents about 21 to 22 percent of the Earth's fresh water. It's hard for us to imagine what that means. I did some calculations and looking up some data. That equals about 5.5 cubic miles of water. That's 5,500 cubic miles of water. A cubic mile of water, think of it, and multiply that by more than 5,000. We're talking about an enormous, unimaginably large volume of water, and it's all fresh water. And for the most part, except for man-made pollution, it's pretty pure water. And when people look at the Great Lakes, including the Indians who lived around them, they reminded people of inland seas. They, they are so large, you don't see across them. They, they act like an ocean. They have rolling waves. They have sustained winds like an ocean does. They have strong currents. They have great depths, although not as deep as our oceans, but nonetheless, quite deep. And five, they have distant horizons. Lake Superior is the largest by far in area. And probably in terms of its volume, it may be the second, I'm not sure, it's either the second or the third largest freshwater body by volume on this earth. Lake Superior, the one at the top with the purple boundaries of drainage basin, is the deepest. It's about 1,333 feet at its deepest, and the lake is about 607 feet above sea level. So it's at the top of this chain, if I can call it that, and the water then flows down from it into the other lakes, which are subsequently stepwise going down towards sea level, but never getting to sea level. <clears throat> So there we are. We start at Lake Superior. What a beautiful view. What an immense body. You, when you go there, you just can't believe it, how anything so large, looking like the ocean, can be so far inland. The Ojibwe Indians had a name for it. I think it's Gichigumi, or maybe it's Gichigama. It depends on who you read. The Great Sea. The French, when they found it, they were the discoverers of all the Great Lakes, but the French called it Le Lac Supérieur, the Superior Lake. The British said, okay, we'll call it Lake Superior, and we Americans have kept that name. 350 miles long, 160 miles wide, and an average depth of 483 feet and a greatest depth of 1,300 feet. It is a magnificent marble. And at the other end, at the end of the Great Lakes, there's this, where many of you have probably gone on vacations, the Thousand Islands. You can take a boat like that. We've done that and cruise around the Thousand Islands. You're at the mouth of the St. Lawrence River. Lake Ontario is just over the horizon. This tremendous volume of water is starting to go down the St. Lawrence River. And it's a magnificent area. Many of these islands have cottages on them, you know, and they're vacation spots. But it's just a beautiful, beautiful area to visit. And that is where the St. Lawrence River begins its journey to the Atlantic Ocean, which is how far? Uh, it depends on how you count. It's 744 miles right out into the Atlantic Ocean, but it's only about 350 or 60 miles to the Gulf of St. Lawrence. It depends on what you want to call your end point in this situation. I took the whole thing and called it 744 miles. Yeah. What I want to do now is quickly go through a series of slides 
showing you the major cities that have cropped up. There's Toronto. You all recognize it probably. Population, 5,928,000. I'm putting the populations in here because they have an effect, or it has an effect, on the Great Lakes. There's Buffalo, New York at the eastern end of Lake Erie. Population, 1,135,000. These are all taken out in the water, somewhere in the lake. Cleveland, Ohio, from a boat on Lake Erie. That's got an interesting view of Cleveland. Population, 2,057,000. Toledo, Ohio, on the western end of Lake Erie. Population, 651,000. I'm not sure how current these population data are, but that gives you an approximate idea. Detroit, we count it on the Great Lakes because it's on the Detroit River. That's just an extension of Lake St. Clair, getting the water down into Lake Erie. Population, 4,296,000. And I think, well, this one, this one, Chicago, on Lake Michigan, population of that area, around 9,400,000. You can see there's a lot of population pressure on these lakes. And that's the point I really want you to take home. And finally, in this sur little survey of lakes, one of the more romantic ideas of the lake are the campgrounds, particularly up in Michigan, but other states as well. Here's, here's a marina and a campground in Michigan on Lake Michigan. And if you look carefully, way in the distance, you can see the open you can see the open Lake Michigan. These are all over Michigan, up on the east side, which is Lake Huron, down the west side, which is Lake Michigan. You find endless campgrounds like this, and they're just, the ones we've been to have been delightful. I got another space picture for you. <clears throat> this one was at a lower altitude. I don't know the altitudes, but what we see here are the eastern ends of the lakes, and uh, hmm, if I had a pointer, I don't think I do, but at any rate, you can follow me. The, the lake that's sort of vertical up, up front here, that is Lake Ontario, and one in the distance, that's Lake Erie. Where it says Lake Erie, you can see that. That's about where Toledo is, roughly, just to give you a rough idea. You can't even see these cities. The altitude here is so large. I want to call your attention to something else in New York State. Go back here over to uh, Lake Ontario and go to the left, and you'll notice some lakes that look like long strips. There's one, two, three, four, five of them and farther on there are six and seven, up to 11 of them. But these are the main, they're the Finger Lakes. And you can see how long they are, they're roughly around 40 some miles long, approximately 400, 450 feet deep, dug by the same glacier that we've been talking about, but this is the way it expressed itself in New York State. I just thought the picture is so, so illustrative of what we want to be talking about. And Niagara Falls, you can't see it, but if you look at the end of Lake Erie and the far top part of Lake Ontario, you can almost see a faint line there, which I think is the Niagara River. That gets you sort of oriented, and of course at the top you can see the curve of the earth. So it gives you a feeling for these lakes. One of the interesting experiences that you can have living in Ohio is to go up to Lake Erie and go out on the Marblehead Peninsula. You cross over the bridge and get onto the northern side of Sandusky Bay. There's a peninsula. You can drive out to the end of it, and at the end of it is a quaint little town called Lakeside. There's a Coast Guard station there, and a few stores, a few churches. People love to go there. It's beautiful, just beautiful. And here's Marilyn. She's standing at the very end of that Marblehead Peninsula. It's this little state park there now. And if you look beyond her, way out, 
Lake Erie disappears in the distance. Keep going that way, you get to Buffalo, but it's a long ways. And she's reading a sign there, which is about the Marblehead Lighthouse. This lighthouse was built, well, it was the first lighthouse on the Great Lakes. It was built in 1821. In those days, it had a kerosene lantern in the top and some way to make it flash, which was a revolving mirror that was mirror on one side and blank on the other so that the blank would shut it off, the light being emitted, and the mirror would reflect. And the whole thing was run by weights. There was no electricity, of course, in 1821. So you crank up boxes about four feet tall and about one and a half to two feet square, filled with rocks. And you crank them up to the top of the lighthouse and let them go, and they would slowly come down. As they did, that energy would be transmitted to the light moving mechanism, the mirror, so that it would run using gravity as its energy source. Of course, every once in a while you go got to crank those, lamp, those rocks back up again, like three or four times a night. And that would be what the man would do who was running the lighthouse. So this is a famous spot. This lighthouse has been there and still works, still run by the Coast Guard now. And I'll show it to you. And it would be right in front of her. And there it is. It's the first lighthouse on the Great Lakes, uh, built in 1821-1822. And it is the oldest continually operated lighthouse on the Great Lakes, operated by the Coast Guard maintained by the Coast Guard. Today, of course, it uses an LED green flash every six seconds, which is visible for 11 miles. This is a terribly important point for ships heading west on Lake Erie because there's a decision to be made here. If you go to the left of this point, you go into Sandusky Harbor, or if you go to the right of it, you go on to Toledo. So it's a very, very important point and that lighthouse had been operational for all those years. <clears throat> it had to be there. So many ships have sunk on the Great Lakes. It's estimated more than 6,000 ships have gone down, on the, and lots of them have never been found. These lakes are so deep, and there's some excitement involved with these. I'm going to tell you about the very first one that was involved that way. And here is a drawing of it. It was built by La Salle in 1679. He was exploring along the St. Lawrence River and west of the St. Lawrence River and east of the St. Lawrence River, even down into New York State. Remember that lake called Lake Champlain? He discovered it and named it, of course, after himself. He decided it was time to build a boat. Now, you can't build this boat on on, on the river. You can't, you've got to get beyond the falls. So he had to build it south of the falls on Lake Erie. You can't build it on Lake Ontario and get to Lake Erie. In those days you couldn't. And this is what he built. Le Griffon was the name of it. After some kind of a mythical animal. And, and it was apparently quite an interesting ship. It could be sailed by about eight men. And as soon as he built it in 1679, he decided he would use it for the fur trade. These people were there because not only did they want the land, but it was the fur trade. We talked about that in some talk quite a while ago. And so they sailed, and what amazes me is what they did. They sailed the length of Lake Erie. They sailed the length of the Detroit River going north. Somehow or other, they sailed across the other lake there, which the name of which I cannot come up with, um, and finally into Lake Huron. They sailed all the way north on Lake Huron. They went through the Straits of Mackinac. How did they know this? I ask myself. And then they sailed across and south on Lake Michigan. And what did they do? There was a large Indian party waiting for them. 
how did they know? This all seemed to work out somehow. And what did the Indians have? They had carloads of beaver skins, pelts. And the French, in their boat, had the kinds of things Indians wanted, rifles, other trinkets, various kinds. And they made the big exchange and loaded Le Griffon with beaver. It must have been immensely valuable. It was de destined to go to Europe. But it had to go backwards then, up Lake Michigan, through the Straits, down Lake Huron, through the rivers and the lakes and Detroit River, and all the way across Lake Erie. And then it would have to be carried around Niagara Falls, put on another boat, down the St. Lawrence to Montreal, and there, and only there, could it be unloaded and put on a seagoing ship. That was the problem. It was still worth it. The only one problem with Le Graffon, it left the trading post that they had established, and somewhere around Grand Bay, Green Bay, which is today Green Bay, Wisconsin, that bay, they encountered an enormous storm. The ship was wrecked, lost permanently. The crew was all killed, and all the beaver pelts were gone, probably at the bottom of the lake. And what's interesting about this vessel is we got this picture. And scuba divers have been trying to find this thing for as long as they've been scuba divers. I see it, I saw the New York Times the other day. Somebody thinks they found it. They found one of the spars. It's got to be analyzed and checked out. Anyway, this ship has never been found, and it has the honor of being the very first sailing vessel on the Great Lakes. Luger foam. Well, let's come into more modern times and get bypass those Frenchmen and get acquainted with this gentleman, a painting found in the Toledo Museum of Art. You all know who he is, Oliver Hazard Perry, the War was the War of 1812, very unpopular. President James Madison, lots of Americans called it Mr. Madison's War. They didn't want to pay for it. They didn't want to fight in it. It had ruined their businesses. All trade from England had stopped. We didn't have a manufacturing base. We needed those materials. So these people, whose stores now were closed, they went bankrupt, they had no, and the, they had no patience with Mr. Madison or Mr. Madison's war. That probably was 50% of the population. Not too hard to imagine, is it, from today's situations about some time. And so this war, which doesn't even have a name except the War of 1812, nobody's ever thought of a name and really nobody cares, I guess, was mostly a sea war, battles in the, in the Atlantic Ocean, battles on the Great Lakes of all places. And this man was very, very important in what happened on the Great Lakes. Madison was advised by his advisors you better do something about Lake Erie and the Great Lakes. The British were there with their warships. They also had to build those warships there because they couldn't come up the St. Lawrence either. Once you get to what is Montreal today, you can't go any further in a sailing vessel because of the rapids, which are tremendous rapids on, on the St. Lawrence. So they had a fleet there, which they had built, and one on Lake Ontario, and they also had a fleet which they built on Lake Erie, and their interest was in Erie, Pennsylvania, and Upper Sandusky to close down those ports so Americans couldn't use them. And they were very successful. They had a very firm blockade of those ports on Lake Erie, 
And President Madison wanted to break that blockade, but how to do it? He picked two men, both outstanding American shipbuilders, a guy by the name of Dobbins, who lived in Erie, Pennsylvania, and a guy by the name of Noah Brown, who lived in New York State. He got them both together and sent them to Erie, Pennsylvania to build a navy. I mean, this is unbelievable. And they did, but they were in a big hurry. The year was 1813, early on. These ships had to be built, warships. You couldn't get them there any, way, uh, any other way. There was no Erie Canal. You, they had to be built there to be used there. And so these two men took control, that is Mr. Dobbins and Mr. Brown, of building two warships. And the president sent a large number of sailors from the East Coast to Buffalo, New York, and then by sailing boats to Erie. The cannons had to be brought the same way for, uh, from the East Coast naval yards to Erie via um, the same route. And then they sent a young naval officer named Oliver Hazard Perry to be in control of the whole thing, to be the watchdog, to be sure the ships were being built right, and to be in command of the two ships, and to do something about the British Navy on Lake Erie. What a job. Here he goes to a little town called Erie, Pennsylvania, which probably had no more than 50 families in it, and in a small bay near there, these two ships were built and were armed and sailors were sent from the east, and Oliver Hazard Perry, born in 1785, took them on a shakedown cruise, and they sailed from Lake Erie. The British were gone by then. They were over in the far western part of Lake Erie, looking out for Detroit. And he got all the way over to what today is Sandusky, Ohio. And there he met, met um, William Henry Harrison, who was the general in charge of this whole Ohio problem, who'd come from Columbus to put in Bay to, to meet Perry and to figure their strategy of how they were going to work this. This young man, a native of Rhode Island, so-called Commodore, I don't know what that means, nor does anybody else, but everyone thinks he gave himself that title. And he became a national hero because he defeated the British fleet on Lake Erie, and he did so. Here's a famous painting. Perry's seen here. He's, aban he's abandoning his flagship, the, the Lawrence, which had been torn to pieces by the British guns. He couldn't even sail it anymore. And he went to the second of his two warships, the Niagara, and took command of the Niagara. And here he is leaving the Lawrence and pointing the way to the Niagara. Famous painting. It's in, as I say, it's in the Toledo Art Museum. He's transferring from the badly damaged Lawrence to the Niagara. And then, for whatever reason, the winds changed in his favor, and he was able to manipulate his sails quickly enough, he could sail right through the British squad squadron and blew them to pieces and won the so-called Battle of Lake Erie. Unbelievable, you know, the first great victory of the Americans in the War of 1812, and he did it. And just a young man. Don't give up the ship. Remember that? That was the flag he had at the top of the mast. And when his first ship, the Lawrence, was blown to pieces, he, brought, he made sure he got that flag and took it to the Niagara and put it up at the top of the mast. Where did those words come from? Well, they were not original with him. Don't give up the ship. Those were the words of his friend, Captain James Lawrence, who the previous June 
had been killed in a naval battle. He was the commander of the Chesapeake ship, and on June 18th, with a battle with the British Navy near Boston, he was killed and his ship was literally destroyed. And as he died on the deck that day, he said, don't give up the ship. And that word got back to his friend, Perry, and <laughs> put it up in a, in a flag like this. It's nearly 10 feet long, by the way. This is the original that you're looking at here, used by Perry on a flag flown on his flagship. The Lawrence, he named it after his friend, but then when that was destroyed, he transferred it to the Niagara, September the 10th, 1813. It was a Monday, a Monday morning. Well, of course, the victory has been celebrated ever since. If you've been to Put-in-Bay, you've seen this monument to, to Perry, this so-called Victory and International Peace Monument on South Bass Island, 352 feet. This is the biggest, biggest one of all, commemorating Perry's victory on September the 10th, 1813, which was a Monday morning, by the way. I think I told you that before against the naval forces on Lake Erie. That was a tremendous victory in the War of 1812. For about seven years after the war ended, the Ni this, this ship, the Niagara, which had been the ship that, that he had, Perry had ended up on and had won the battle with, continued to sail Lake Erie as a part of the U.S. Navy, because there was no longer a war. But it was in terrible condition. You see, the trouble was the ship, these ships had to be built so fast that the lumber was green. There wasn't time to, to treat the lumber and to dry it properly. Therefore, it shrunk. And as it shrunk, the seams would open up, and these things would flood. And it was a terrible problem to keep them afloat for years. And after the War of 1812 was over, the ship continued to be used, but it was just not effective. It was poorly built, and with great sadness, it was taken back to Erie, sailed it back to Erie, taken into the little bay, which is at Erie, Pennsylvania, which is relatively shallow water, and they decided to preserve it by sinking it. Don't ask me the rationale for that, but that's what they did. They, they took down the sails, they took off the mast, all the ropes and the rigging and all the rest of it, and sank the hulk so it could hardly be seen. And there it sat for nearly 70-some years underwater. And then It got to be 1913. Remember the battle was 1813. Oh, we got a centennial coming up, some people said. Wouldn't it be great if the Niagara could sail again? Well, that was a crackpot idea. The thing was underwater in this bay, but by golly, they raised it. And there was hardly anything left. You can see, that that's the picture of it right there. <laughs> that doesn't look like a seagoing ship, does it? It was, it's a wreck, literally, but they fixed it up, rebuilt it into its original form, and they sailed it all around, well, at least all around Lake Erie, visiting the ports as part of the centennial celebration of the War of 1812 and the battle that, that occurred at that point. Let me show you what it looked like. We luckily have a picture of the reconstructed Niagara from the keel and what you see here. I don't know where that picture is taken. You can two, see two other ships there. They're steamboats. But there's the reconstructed Niagara for the 1913 centennial celebration of the Battle of Put-in-Bay. As I said, the original keel was used in their construction but much of the rest of it. And so, what to do with it? After the people who promoted this never thought about what to do with it afterwards, it went back to 
Erie, Pennsylvania, was docked and continued to rot there and weather. And finally, it sunk right alongside the dock. And visitors would come from everywhere, and everybody would take a chunk of it home with them as sort of a souvenir. So there was virtually nothing left except the keel, which was more or less rotten, and a few of the ribs, which were certainly the same way. And it was all a very sad story. And then in 1988, there was this movement. This is 125 years after the, thing, the original was built. There was this movement to rebuild the, uh, the Niagara, not to work on the corpse of the one in, at the bottom in Pennsylvania, but to rebuild it according to the original plans and show it. And they did it. And here's a picture of the second Niagara, which is just exactly as the first Niagara looked. There it is. And you can see the new USS Niagara. Now notice I'm using the term USS. In the Battle of 1812, no American ships were called USS. That was brought about by Theodore Roosevelt almost 100 years later and passed through the Congress. It's now the new Niagara, which is exactly like Perry's ship, is sailing here on Lake Erie. It's built of seasoned wood. There, you, there was an important point. Yellow pine, Douglas fir, and only teeny tiny bits of the original are in there, mostly as decorative memorial historic things, pieces of metal that were used, some of the nails, uh, some wooden parts not functioning anymore, but there as sort of memorials, as mementos, really, of that past. And so the ship today is owned by the U.S. Coast Guard. It is used every summer for training Coast Guard cadets from the Coast Guard Academy in New London, Connecticut. And they learn to sail on a sailing ship that goes historically represents the original USS Niagara. Beautiful. I got another picture of it here, I think, uh, under little different circumstances. There we are. That's Commodore Perry's ship. This new Niagara sails in Lake Erie and visits ports. Here it's coming into the port at Toledo during the Tall Ships Festival of 2012. It's still up there. You, you can see it. It's, I'm not sure where it's birthed on the lake, but it could be um, where the original was birthed. I don't know. That's a picture, a statue. There are a number of statues of Oliver Hazard Perry. This is a famous one. It's in his home state of Rhode Island. He was born in Rhode Island. And this is on the side of the steps leading to the Rhode Island State House in Providence statue of Oliver Hazard Perry showing him in a very commanding sort of position. I have a sneaking suspicion he would have liked the way he's being depicted here. We'll finish our story today by talking about what happened to Perry. It's a sad story, really. Um, after the war was over, um, he was given the mission of taking a flotilla of Navy ships from the United States to Venezuela. It turned out that the Caribbean was infested with pirates, and the government of the United States wanted to go into some kind of negotiation with Venezuela to try and minimize piracy in the Mediterranean, and they chose Oliver Hazard Perry to do the job. So he was in command of this thing. He got to Venezuela, okay. He had to sail up the Orinoco River, which he did to meet with Simon Bolivar. Now, Simon Bolivar was the George Washington of South America. He freed all those countries under Spanish rule. He freed them of Spain, and they became independent democracies each in their own right. He was a very, very important man, very famous in South America. We hardly know him, but this conference 
was such to talk about what to do about the pirate. And evidently, it was successful. And so it was time to go home, and Perry turned his flagship around, and they went back down the Orinoco, and as they went along, a yellow fever epidemic was everywhere around them on the land, and it got on board the ship, and some of his men came down with yellow fever, and he came down with yellow fever. They were so far from America, not that it made much difference, I suppose, but it was thought that they knew there were medical facilities in Trinidad, which is an island just off Venezuela, and they made a beeline for that, but it was too late. He died en route to Trinidad, and when they got there, he was buried in Trinidad. Well, this is a terrible story, as you can well imagine. He was a hero, and everyone knew about his problem. So he was not moved for 10 years. Then the people of Rhode Island wanted his remains to be brought back to Rhode Island and given a proper burial in Rhode Island, in the capital city of Rhode Island. And so a, 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 a contingent naval ship went to uh, the island, got the body, took it back, and he was given a burial. And this is his grave site that you see, having died of yellow fever, 1819, where he was commanding a naval mission against Caribbean pirates, and it was 10 years later that he was reburied. He's next to his father, actually, in this so-called the common burying ground is what is the name of that cemetery. Which brings us pretty much to the story of the end of the story, the yellow fever epidemic, such a terrible, it reminds me of today's virus problems. Again, it's a virus. Turns out that this one's a yellow fever is an RNA virus, and our virus today, I think, is a DNA virus. It doesn't make much difference except to the virus, but it produced very serious diseases, and yellow fever was one of them. It just killed people by the thousands. In Philadelphia, for example, you know, uh, nearly 11,000 people got that disease, and fully 10% of that population died of yellow fever, and nobody knew what caused it. It was caused by the mosquito bite, where you get the virus injected into you as the mosquito would take your blood. Today, that's no longer a problem, because we know it's a mosquito, but they didn't know it was a mosquito. Well, <clears throat> today, it's not the British who have a problem involving Lake Erie and us. Today, it's us and Lake Erie having a problem, and there you can see it, the pollution that's in Lake Erie. That's all algae, all blue-green algae. That's at a swimming beach here on Lake Erie in Ohio. That was during the summer of 2014. It crops up almost every summer. The lake is in terrible condition because of pollution. And you may remember that it was Toledo that had their complete water supply cut off just a couple of years ago because of this condition, because the toxins from this, actually, it's not an algae. We now know it's a bacterium, but it's still called a blue-green algae. That was a mix-up going way back in time. Anyway, the toxin from this is very deadly. Uh, it can cause brain problems, balance problems, and intestinal disease and liver degeneration. I mean, if one thing doesn't get you, something else will with these allergies and the, and the, uh, the product which they, they turn out. So the problem today is called H-A-B, capitalized, and just for your information, H A. B stands for harmful, that's that H, 
algal, that's the A, bloom, that's the B, harmful algal bloom. This is all algae, and actually, <laughs> it, it's, it's just difficult. It's not really an algae, it acts like an al algae, but it's really a bacterium that is able to carry on photosynthesis. And when the temperature is right, and the sunlight of summer is there, and other pollutants are in the lake, this stuff blooms. There is what it looks like. It's the cyano, meaning blue, the cyanobacterium microcystis. Blue is called a blue-green algae. It is actually a bacterium, and it can produce lake water. And what it does, it produces two kinds of toxins. One is deadly to the liver, and the other one to the brain. That's why Toledo shut down its water supply and you couldn't use it for anything. No dishwashing, certainly no bathing, and absolutely no drinking. It couldn't be used. It's that deadly. And you might say, well, I could put it on the stove and heat it. No, because this microcystin poison is not destroyed by heat. So it was very, very serious. And it's going to happen again because the lake is in such terrible condition. And there's an aerial view of the western end of Lake Erie, just to get you oriented. I'm not sure I can show you here, but it's um, you can see it's the blue part is maybe over towards the Cleveland end to the right. That's the deepest area. Everything to the left is that light grayish blue. That's the that's the, the the algae growing in it. You know, all the white in different areas on the lake and other parts. Those are cloud cover, and you can see Lake St. Clair up above, and Detroit's in between them. But it's so high you can't even make out the details, and you certainly can't see Toledo, which would be over here on the left part of the picture. Excess phosphorus in the lake is the problem. There's the last picture. I wanted you to see another famous lighthouse, which is called the Ludington Lighthouse on Lake Michigan. I remember seeing it some years ago, and maybe many of you have seen it. So that brings us to the end of our discussion on Lake Erie, the Battle of Lake Erie, and something about the people who lived around Lake Erie, and the modern aspects of Lake Erie. Thank you for your attention.